What up, you nerds? I'm Fallout, and today I've got 13 tips for you on how to immediately improve at Back for Blood and not suck so much. If you don't know about Back for Blood, it's unofficially Left for Dead 3, made by Turtle Rock Studios. There's an open beta going on right now, so before you download and dive in, tip time, baby. But before we get going, I want to give a shout out to the sponsor of today's video, Ridge Wallets. These things are beautiful, and I'm glad to promote them on my channel because I've actually been using one myself for about the past year. No joke, this right here has been my actual wallet. A lot of guys I know are still lugging around wallets like this. Big, bulky, floppy, and uncomfortable, doesn't sit well in your pocket, and you gotta move it around when you sit down. As I mentioned, over a year of the Ridge Wallet, and I'm just never going back. It's light, sleek, and efficient. It doesn't fold or bulge out awkwardly in your pocket. It's got room for all my cards and a clip for bills when I am carrying cash. They've got over 30 colors and styles on their website, including carbon fiber and burnt titanium. Sounds like a Destiny shader. They've got 30,000 five-star reviews. One of them being mine, and each wallet comes with a lifetime warranty. Yes, you can buy just one wallet and boom, carry and use it for life. The Ridge is so confident you'll like it that they'll let you test drive it for 45 days, and if you don't, you can send it back for a full refund. Get 10% off today with free worldwide shipping and returns by going to ridge.com slash falloutplays and use promo code falloutplays. Link to their site in the video description and thank you again to Ridge for sponsoring today's video. All right, back to the content. Tip number one, minimize trauma. Back in Left 4 Dead, health was really straightforward. You take damage, you heal it off, easy. In Back 4 Blood, you not only take damage, but mental trauma as well. If you take a look at your health bar, a solid red bar is gonna show you damage that you can easily heal by using a med kit or bandages. The striped red and black bar though, that is your mental trauma. Doesn't matter how many med kits you try to heal with, can't put a band-aid on bad memories, apparently. The more damage you take in Back 4 Blood, the worse your trauma will get over time. So naturally, you want to make sure you're taking care of it whenever you can. Look for first aid stations around the map. They are red boxes on the wall that you and your team can use. The first time anybody on your team uses that particular first aid station, you'll be able to heal a portion of your health and trauma for free. After that first time though, each use of the first aid station will cost 400 copper per time. It's really worth the cost though, each and every time, because the worse your trauma gets, the more you're lowering how high your health bar can be overall. There's also certain cards you you can add to your deck, something we'll go over later, that can give you extra trauma protection, meaning it'll take more for your trauma to get lowered to begin with. No word yet on if you'll be able to send your characters to therapy for long-term benefits, but for right now, get anti-trauma cards and watch for first aid stations. Tip number two, know your character perks. In Left 4 Dead, I usually mained whichever character I thought was the most badass, i.e. Zoe. In Back 4 Blood, what character you play actually makes a big difference to the team dynamic. Each cleaner, i.e. zombie killer, comes with unique perks, as well as benefits to the team overall. Let's quickly go through each one. Evangelo can break out of grabs one time every minute, has better breakout speed and stamina regen, and gives the team a movement speed buff. Hoffman has a chance to find ammo on a zombie kill, can carry an extra offensive inventory item, and also gives the team more ammo capacity. Holly recovers 10 stamina whenever she kills a zombie, has extra damage resist, and gives the team more stamina overall. Mom can immediately revive a downed teammate one time per level and can carry one extra support inventory item. She also has one extra life for the team overall, and it doesn't say it here, but I'm sure she can also nag you about your life choices. Walker gets better accuracy after a headshot kill, extra damage output overall, and a buff to everyone on the team's overall health. Doc can heal low health teammates without needing to use a healing item, has more efficient healing overall, and gives the team additional resistance to trauma. Carly has the ability to sense hazards, has a bonus quick slot in the inventory, and gives the team a team use speed bonus. Jim can aim his weapon faster, might not sound like much, but definitely can't help, but gets increased damage on precision kills and has better team weak spot damage overall. Knowing what exactly your character brings to the table and does better than everybody else can help you think more about what cards you want to bring into the game and what loadouts you want to try and rock to maximize the overall success of your team. For example, melee builds are really fun, but Jim and all his gun damage related perks sound like maybe he ain't the right guy you want to give an axe to. Tip number three, maximize your gameplay settings immediately. The two most important ones I can think of are your FOV, which you should crank way up right away, and the second one being to never turn off in-game captions. The reason for that is that captions in Back 4 Blood are riddled with helpful in-game callouts. You're often going to be notified in the captions that special ridden are lurking around the area before 
before you're able to even see them. If you don't mind about catching every little character quip and want to go full on MLG, you can change the captions off of full to ambient and gameplay only. That way your caption feed won't get cluttered up with dialogue, but you'll keep all the important callout information regarding the written. Tip number four, have big deck energy. Building a deck with cards that give you benefits is one of the things that IMO makes B4B fun AF. But you gotta make sure that you kinda know what you're doing. The most important thing to remember is that when building your own deck, order matters. Whatever cards you pick first, you will always begin a campaign with that one card on top as your starting card. After that, each and every time you progress through the campaign, you'll be able to pick another card from your deck. The order, again, is determined in advance by you, meaning that any cards you really want early on should absolutely be put at the top of your deck. Once you unlock more and more cards, you can really start to flesh out unique builds. Just always make sure you're keeping the order of your deck at the top of your mind. Also, when you're in the campaign, be sure you're really thorough when hunting around in out of the way rooms and whatnot. Sometimes you can find cards that you're going to be able to add to your deck immediately in the middle of the game. Lower level cards are usually free, but sometimes you can find a more powerful card that usually costs a little bit of copper. Adding it to your deck will keep it active for the remainder of the campaign, meaning most times it's worth it. Tip number five, remember to bash. Using your melee bash is something you should do frequently if you're getting gang banged by a rowdy wrangle of Ridden. Gotta be clear, a melee bash is different than a melee weapon, by the way. Melee weapons, like the bat or the machete, only have the option to swing away, but if you have an actual gun in your hand, hitting melee will let you punch in front of you. It does minimal damage, but it will give you breathing room to line up a kill shot, and on top of that, meleeing does not interrupt weapon reloading, meaning you can reload your gun, and even if you melee, the gun will continue reloading without interruption. Tip number six, A, B, BP, always be pinging. Like a lot of games these days, Back for Blood comes with a ping system and there are two ways to use it. You got the quick ping option, you just hit one button, Q for M and K people, L1 for PlayStation and left bumper for Xbox. The other option is to bring up a wheel and pick the icon you want to choose manually. After a little experience with both, I'm probably just going to use the quick ping option because I think it's easier and I'm too lazy for the wheel. Call outs on a microphone are always helpful, but being able to ping the exact location of a special ridden or the exact location of a first aid station, a weapon you think your friend might want to pick up, those are all really good to have as well. Tip number seven, leave the f***ing birds alone. Like Left 4 Dead, there are hazards in B4B where if triggered, you will summon the horde. Birds will do exactly that. The game tells you flat out not to go near them. You can actually get fairly close though without freaking them out, but the thing that really trips up players is that if you shoot a weapon at or anywhere near the birds, that will trigger them. I've seen way more hordes summoned via accidental gunfire than stepping near the bird. So if there are any ridden near bird clumps by your team, let them be. And if the ridden charge you, make sure you don't accidentally wind up shooting a bird pile. Use the ping system to alert that one schmuck in your team who never minds the freaking birds. Trust me, there's always one. Tip number eight, coordinate your weapon and ammo types. In Back for Blood, you go through ammo pretty damn quickly. And because ammo is usually in limited supply, you gotta plan ahead. If you have an entire team of cleaners rolling through a campaign all with the same weapon type, i.e. four people with auto rifles, four people all with shotguns, whatever, you're gonna be starving for ammo all the time because all four of you are sharing from the same unique ammo pool. It's like trying to have four dogs eat dinner out of one small bowl rather than giving each dog their own bowl. It might be a pain to organize, but you're gonna be way better off at higher levels of gameplay by trying your best to split up weapon types. Maybe have have one person on rifle ammo, one on sniper ammo, one on SMG, and one on shotgun. Doesn't always have to work out perfectly that way, and that's fine, but definitely make sure that there aren't three or four dudes in your group rocking the same primary weapon and eating into each other's ammo all the time. Remember, not every gun in the game takes ammo that you would expect. Sometimes there are exceptions. For example, there are a few pistols in the game that are so powerful they actually run on sniper ammo. These are the kind of things you gotta communicate about and keep in mind to make sure that you and your group don't immediately burn through all your ammo. And stock up on ammo whenever you can, by the way, because even if you're not using ammo of a particular weapon type, you can always open your menu and drop
drop that ammo for a teammate to use if they're running dry. Tip number nine, coordinate gear buying and share money. Don't be a greedy ass cleaner. Sharing money in Back for Blood is so important to making your team better. At the beginning of a new section in a campaign, open the in-game shop and try to pool money together for team upgrades, usually indicated by a gold icon. Yeah, I know they're really expensive, but they're worth the price. Just like ammo sharing, you can open up your menu at any time and drop extra copper on the ground to share with a teammate. By pooling your money together, you can buy that pricey team upgrade and reap the benefits hardcore. Likewise, coordinate who's going to buy what gear. It's usually a good idea to have someone in the group bring a med kit and also a good idea for someone to bring a toolkit. There's usually a bunch of locations you'll find in game that you can only access by bringing a toolkit. And usually there's a bunch of really good gear contained within that hidden room. So yeah, make sure that you're heading out into the wild with a planned variety of gear so you got all your bases covered. Tip number 10, hit enemies where they are weak. Enemies in Back for Blood have weak points. You should take advantage of that. When shooting a gun in game, you'll often see a golden hit marker pop up on your HUD. That indicates that you've hit a zombie in a weak point. For regular ridden, that'll be in the head. But for unique ridden, you want to look for whatever glowing red and or pink spot that they have on their body. Wherever that fleshy, glowy red part is, that's where you got to shoot to deal extra damage. Tip number 11, make sure that snitches get stitches. The snitch is a unique rhythm that is kind of like a living alarm. Whenever triggered, it'll freak out and make a ton of noise, summoning a horde to your location. After a little trial and error, we learned that even though your first instinct might be to shoot the snitch quickly to put it down, firing a gun at it will actually trigger it to sound the alarm. So how do you deal with them? One of two ways, either flat out avoid them completely, they have very bad eyesight and can be duped and ditched with little problem, or you can go with option number two, run up on it in a group and beat the ever loving sh out of it. Snitches are apparently easily stunned by a close range beating. So with everyone working together, you can just roundhouse it into oblivion before it calls for backup. Tip number 12, don't ignore corruption cards. Before launching a campaign, you will be given corruption cards by the game, which are kind of like negative gameplay modifiers or extra challenge incentives. Corruption cards can give you unique kinds of infected to be on the lookout for at higher levels of play, or they can give you extra rewards if you beat an act while doing whatever challenge is written on the card. Either way, you gotta make sure that you pay attention. And tip number 13, crouch already. Now you might not have to worry about this on the easiest level of difficulty, but at mid to high level difficulty, hitting an ally with friendly fire is a big setback. You can do so much damage to an ally in the blink of an eye, and with trauma capping your dwindling health pool, you can often cause more pain to your own team than the ridden can. There are going to be times where you want to herd enemies into a tight bottleneck like a hallway or a doorway, and when that happens, make sure that anyone on your team who is standing out in the front front crouches down to make sure they aren't getting shot in the back of the dome. Trust me, if you ever want to try max difficulty, friendships will be made or broken by incidents involving friendly fire. Avoid hurting each other and remember to crouch in bottleneck situations to avoid shooting each other. And there you go. If you're out there making a mess in the open beta and you got your own tips on how to get better at the game right away, let me know what they are down in the comment section. Do me a favor and hit the like button if today's video helped you out in any way and remember to click subscribe for more not completely terrible gaming content. Thank you very much and I'll see you next time.